Imagine you're trying to eliminate a disease that kills thousands of children each year. You have a rich donor. You have a safe and effective vaccine. And if you can get that vaccine to 95% of children in an area, you can eliminate that disease. Sounds easy, right? We're going to need two things, firstly. The first one, detailed maps of towns, the cities, the villages, so our teams of vac vaccinators can know where to go. And we can work out where they're going to go, how they plan out their vaccine routes. Secondly, we need estimates of the number of children in these areas so that we can work out how much vaccine we're going to need and what it's going to cost. So let's go back to the first one, those detailed maps. Think about how you got here today, how you find your way around in an unfamiliar place. If you're like me, then perhaps you look on your phone, you look on the computer, and you look on something like Google Maps. It's fantastic. We have every single building mapped out. It's perfect for planning a vaccination route. We know that if we are going to visit all of these buildings, we're going to get to 95% of those children. <laughs> That's great. And it's the same across the UK, every building mapped out. But let's think about a country that does have problems in terms of childhood infectious diseases, not the UK. Let's go to Nigeria and think about one of the biggest, biggest cities in the world, Kano in northern Nigeria. It's four million people. It's about the size of Los Angeles. Surely we have similar data. This is what we have. We have a problem. It's going to be challenging to design a vaccination campaign using data like this. And what about the rural areas that are even more affected by childhood infectious diseases? It's, like it's not a broken slide. There are villages here, and they're, they're not on the map. Maybe they're not on a digital map, but maps do exist. And these kind of maps are plentiful. Um, not great for planning a vaccination campaign where we're trying to get to 95% of the children if we're using a turn right at the cow map. So we've got a problem that needs fixing on the first detailed map need. The second, estimates of children. So we can estimate how much vaccine is needed, um, how much it's going to cost. Let's go back to the UK. Fantastic data again. For every single small area in the country, we have estimates of the number of people, number of children. It's come from a very relatively recent census, but it's kept up to date by good registers of births and deaths. Surely if a small country like the UK can do this, a much bigger country that is impacted by infectious diseases, we're going to have good data as well. This is the Democratic Republic of Congo in the center of Africa. It's about the size of Western Europe. It's huge. And that data on the right is the best population data we have. Looks OK, but each one of those units, those blobs, is about the size of Switzerland or Scotland. How are we going to use that to work out accurately how much vaccine we need? And where does that data come from? It comes from a census taken in 1984. We really don't know how many people there are in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Maybe it's just an outlier. Look in other countries of the world, it's not really the case. There are many countries of a similar situation, and even more where registers of births and deaths to keep those numbers up to date are non-existent or incomplete. So we've got a big problem. We've got incomplete data. We've got a lack of the basic demographic data, basic maps for us to be able to plan the vaccine campaigns. What can we do? We could do a massive set of censuses across all of these countries. Those countries have tried to do that for many years. It's very expensive. It's logistically challenging. Um, and that prevents a barrier, presents a barrier. So, so far, I've painted a pretty bleak picture. Um, sorry about that. But here's where things start to turn around. And it's due to technologies that have developed in all of our lifetimes, and particularly in the last five or 10 years. Let's start with the first. So 
satellite images that were taken from space of the Earth. When I was doing my PhD in the geography department, this is the kind of data we were using. It's OK, it's a bit blocky. We can pick out some features, but not great for trying to understand an area. But over the past five, 10 years, things have really improved. We've got sharper and sharper images. And look, we can now see every single building. We can see roof types. In some cases, we can even see people, animals, cars. If you're thinking like me, we can use this image to make those maps that we need for an area. These images are all over the world now. So how do we get there? We could draw around each of those buildings. I could perhaps do that by the end of the day. But for an entire country, it's going to take me a year. It's going to take years to do all the countries we need to. And by the time I've done that, we have to go back to the start again, because populations have grown. So what can we do? And this is where another technology comes in. This was my family computer when I was growing up. We used it to play pretty basic games that my children find hilarious. Um, but nowadays, things have changed substantially. And just this phone in my pocket now has 50,000 times more memory than that computer. And that's just my phone. Think about supercomputers nowadays. We can train those computers just like you and I, on an image like this in rural Afghanistan, can see and pick out those compounds, those buildings. A computer can be trained to do exactly the same. So in a fraction of a second, it can pick out all of those structures. And great, we have our map that the vaccinators can use. We know if we give the map to the vaccinators and tell them to go to every single area in red, we're pretty sure we've covered 95% of those children. So that gives us that fix for the first thing we need. The second thing, how many children are there in each of those red areas? Well, we don't need to go and visit every single household and every single settlement. If we can get bits of data on the population totals across the types of neighborhoods that exist across the country and villages, then there's good evidence that we can use that to produce accurate population maps. How do we do that? Well, we need to tell survey teams where to go. And again, that's where the technologies come in. And again, I can bring this out of my pocket. Within all of your phones, likely, is a global positioning system, GPS. You may have driven around being directed by that in your car. And we can draw a box around one of these settlements to get valuable data. And that appears on the tablets, on the phones of survey teams out in the field who can then go and count the number of people in that small area and give us valuable data for translating this into a population map. So we have all the pieces together. We have our up-to-date, pretty reliable population map. We have our maps to tell the vaccinators where to go. And this is exactly what's been done in the last few years in northern Nigeria, saving millions in wasted vaccines, reaching those populations who've never been on the map before and have never even received vaccines, and ultimately eliminating polio from northern Nigeria. Fantastic. We're all done, and I've still got nine minutes left, so... <laughs> but... There's a problem, and this is it. People move, and people move a lot. It would make our lives much easier in the, doing these maps if people just stayed where they were. <laughs> so we've got to account for that. And those movements change those population numbers. It impacts our ability to get to that, those 95% of children. It spreads the disease around more. So what can we do? You'll see again, I'm reaching for my pocket and bringing out the mobile phone. This is a smartphone, it could be a dumb phone, it could be a 3G phone, but this kind of technology is providing solutions. 30 years ago, if you had a mobile phone, you probably looked like this, and there probably weren't many other people with mobile phones to talk to, but things have changed substantially 
over recent years. There are now more mobile phones on the planet than people. And in the countries that we're focused on that are impacted by childhood diseases, those phone ownership rates have rocketed. So how is that actually useful? Well, we're all leaving digital traces in all of our communications. We leave a trace of where we've been, that communication, receiving a communication. And how is that useful? Let's see, for a country that's perhaps not our, our focus type of country, this, of course, is France. And we can take phone tower activity and translate that into population densities. That gives us immediately a population map. Fantastic. But the real benefit here is that this data on phone usage is being collected day by day, every minute, every second. And that can be translated into population dynamics. So here we see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of each day of the week. Those fluctuations as people move around. And here in France, Monday, working in the cities. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, starting to go into the countryside. Saturday, Sunday, in the vineyards. <laughs> Monday, back to work. And here's holiday time. People moving to the, out of the cities to the coast. So this is all great. This is France. It's not a country of, that we're focused on for this talk. But these kind of approaches are being used in many other low- and middle-income countries, Here, like this. Bangladesh, and it's helping us capture those millions of population movements that have previously affected our abilities to get to that magic 95%. And nowhere are our abilities impacted more than when disaster or conflict strikes. And there, pop mass population movements, populations who are vulnerable to infectious diseases in new locations, and challenges of getting data to allocate and direct aid. So what can we do? Nepal, 2015 earthquake. As it says here, estimates of up to 300,000 people fleeing the devastated city. Where were they going? If we're going to be able to target aid and get that aid to those people, the limited resources we have, and use it in an effective way, we need to know where they've gone. And this is where, again, just like in France, we have this data from the mobile phones. We can understand, we can produce dynamic maps of where those populations are being displaced. And at the request of aid agencies, take those billions of bits of information and turn those into simple maps that can then be used to direct aid. Here, seeing just above normal population flows from Kathmandu, where are those hundreds of thousands of people going? So, I asked you to imagine at the start, but maybe we don't need to imagine. We, there are rich donors out there. There are safe and effective vaccines out there. And thanks to the technologies in your pocket and in space looking down on us, we can have the information now to move the elimination of childhood diseases from our imaginations to reality. Thank you.